This is part four in a series of videos about the origin of the elements. In this video, we're going to be looking at how nuclear synthesis happens inside low mass stars. So in a previous video, we talked a little bit about nuclear synthesis, that is making new elements um, inside of stars. And basically that for what most uh, what stars are doing for most of their lives, that's all stars for most of their lives, are just using hydrogen to make helium and shining as a, pro, uh, as a result of that. But we don't have any heavier elements. We made helium in the Big Bang. We're still making helium inside stars, but we need to make some heavier elements. Now, the core of the star is the only place where it's hot enough and dense enough for fusion to go on. We talked about why we need such high temperatures and densities in a previous video, but without that, you can't make fusion happen. And so once you've used up all the hydrogen, you've converted it all into helium, you've no longer got any fuel. And that means that you are no longer able to keep the gas that's in the center of the star hot, that energy is flowing away, and so it starts to cool down. And as it cools down, the gas pressure drops, and so gravity starts to win. Pressure is constantly pushing out, gravity is trying to pull in, and as gravity wins, the core is gonna collapse in. But in the process, it heats up because it's converting potential energy to kinetic energy. It's taking the fact that the stuff is collapsing under gravity, it's speeding up those atoms, and that means that the temperature is increasing. So it's heating up and heating up as it collapses. And eventually it gets hot enough to fuse helium, that is stick heliums together to make the next thing, which is carbon. Uh, remember we talked about how uh, the temperature you need to stick atoms together depends on which atoms you're trying to stick together. And so for hydrogen, with just the atomic number one, it has one proton, it's relatively easy to push them together. But helium has two protons each, and so it takes more energy to get them to stick together. And so when we talk about helium fusion or helium burning, what we get is we take four helium, three heliums, and we stick them together to make carbon. Now, just a little aside about helium burning. It's not burning in the sense of burning fire like we have on Earth, but because astronomy is an old subject and the idea that stars are burning is quite old, um, this idea of burning meaning fusion has kind of stuck with us. So helium burning in the astronomical context actually means fusion, sticking helium atoms together to make heavier things. As you can see here, it takes much higher temperatures. So it takes about 50 million Kelvin to start doing hydrogen fusion. Here it takes about 100 million Kelvin. Remember, that's going to be of the order of 200-ish million Fahrenheit. Um, and then you can start sticking heliums together. And here I've got three helium nuclei, so two protons and two neutrons. You stick them together and you get a carbon and you get an energy release in the form of gamma rays. Again, this energy release is the binding energy. We talked about that in a previous video, where you are binding together these nuclei, and as they are bound together, some energy is lost outside. That's the energy you would have to give back to break them up. We sometimes call this the triple alpha process, and that has to do with the fact that the helium nucleus is the same as an alpha particle. So when we talk about uh, radioactivity and radiation, there are three different types of radiation alpha, beta, and gamma. And obviously those are the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. They were just named that way until we understood them. And now we understand them, those names have stuck. And so the first one, alpha particles, are the same as helium nuclei. The second ones, beta particles, we'll get into in a future video. Those beta particles are in fact electrons. And then gamma is this energy that's coming off. So the gamma radiation is not a particle um, except that it's a photon, it's a particle of energy, it's light that's coming out. And so we have uh, this terminology that's stuck around. But consequently, we call this the triple alpha process because we're taking three alpha particles and sticking them together. So here we have helium burning. So three heliums come together and it makes carbon. Let's watch that again. Three heliums come together and we get some gamma rays flying out and that gives us a carbon afterwards. Okay, so let's talk about stellar evolution. What we really mean is how stars age, what happens to stars throughout their lives. So I talked about how at the end of 
the main phase of a star's life. It's run out of hydrogen in the core. The hydrogen's all be converted to helium. And so now you've got a core full of helium. And that's what we're seeing here, the helium ash. It is just lots and lots of helium nuclei, but they're not sticking together yet. They're not fusing or burning because it's not hot enough. But because this collapses and that drags some of the material around it with it, this material still has hydrogen in it. The rest of the star is still mostly hydrogen as well, but it's not hot enough or dense enough to do fusion. But here it does get hot enough and dense enough. So we get hydrogen burning in a shell around here. And so actually during this phase, this hydrogen burning shell, it's making energy and it makes this the rest of the star spread out into a much bigger space. And so we get what's called a red giant star. This is what the sun will do. It will become a red giant as it dies. But eventually the core becomes hot enough to fuse helium. And then you start sticking heliums together to make carbon. But eventually you're gonna run out of helium too, right? There's only a certain number of helium atoms in there. And so now you've got carbon ash. And the carbon ash is what's left behind. But as the core shrinks down and gets smaller, you've now got some helium that was previously made in this part here. That can now start fusing because it's got hot enough and dense enough. And you've got this region here, which used to be part of the outer part of the star. It's now hot enough to do hydrogen fusion. And so you've got hydrogens sticking together to make helium, helium sticking together to make carbon, and carbon not doing much. At this stage, the star can't get past this. It never gets hot enough in the core to make carbon stick together. The reason for this has to do with uh, quantum mechanics and how you can't basically stick things arbitrarily close together. Um, at higher temperatures, you can get them close together, but this never gets to high enough temperature. And so it just stops shrinking. And it's just this core full of carbon and not doing anything else. But we did have um, helium fusion going on in a shell around the core, and we had some previously going on. So let's have a look at the helium fusion in a little bit more detail. We've got two helium atoms, and when we stick them together, we get a beryllium, and we get some energy out. But this beryllium is not very stable. It will tend to fall apart again back into the alpha particles, into the two helium nuclei. And so what you need is you need to have the beryllium meet up with another helium very quickly so that they can stick together and make carbon. And that will also re release more energy, another gamma ray. So you need this step to happen. And then this one has to happen in fairly quick succession before the beryllium has a chance to fall apart again. Now, once you've got carbon-12, that can be um, a thing that you add more to. Now, remember that the bigger the elements are, the more protons they have, the higher their positive charge and the harder it is to stick things together. So once you've got carbon, adding the next helium is a little bit harder. And if you add an, a helium to a carbon, you get an oxygen. Once you've got the oxygen, it's harder to stick a helium on. But if you do, you get a neon. Once you've got neon, it's harder to stick the helium on. But if you do, you get a magnesium and so on. And you can keep going, add another helium to magnesium, you get silicon, add another one, you get sulfur, add another one, you get argon, and so on. And so simply by sticking these helium-4 nuclei together with a bigger nucleus, you're able to build up from just having helium to having something that is uh, much, much more massive. This is nickel-56. Now, as I said, it gets harder and harder to do this, um, but what we see here is we're making things that are called alpha rich. So these alpha rich elements are basically elements that are made up of lots of alphas or alpha particles or helium nuclei. So also we get other isotopes. In a previous video, we talked about isotopes, how an element is defined by the number of protons, but it can have a different number of neutrons and still be the same element. When we were looking at the CNO cycle in a previous um, a previous video, we start with carbon 12. And as we add hydrogens to it, we can make carbon 13 and nitrogen 14. And so we're able to use that as something. So if instead of adding another proton to the carbon 13, instead we add a helium or an alpha particle, now we've got oxygen 17 instead of oxygen 16. If we take this nitrogen 14 that we've made and add another alpha particle, helium, now we've got a fluorine 
If we take that fluorine and add another helium, now we've got sodium. If we take that sodium and have add another helium, we get aluminium or aluminum for Americans. So we've got all of these different ways we can start to make things. So once you've made some bigger elements, you can use them as different starting points to make more different isotopes and different elements that aren't just alpha rich. So again, let's come back to talking about low mass stars and how they compare to high mass stars. In a low mass star, you don't get past sticking heliums together. So you've got a core made of carbon, but it's not going to do any more fusion. And these stars are generally below eight solar masses. They're just not hot enough to fuse carbon. Now, what we get is that the stars are going to pulsate. Now, this is going to show you what's happening where the red stuff is hot and the blue stuff is cool. This is just a demonstration that these stars, as they pulsate, they're actually bringing cooler and hotter material up to the surface. And so as they cool uh, and they're going to grow and they're going to cool and they're going to heat up. And so we're getting material brought up from down below. Let's have another look at this. This is basically the same object. But now what we're going to see is this is a cross cut through. So we have convection current. So we have material that's deep down where you're actually doing fusion and you're bringing it up to the surface. And at the same time, the stuff that's at the surface is cooling off and shrinking back down. Kind of like when you have a pan boiling, the water is moving up to the surface, gets cooler, shrinks back down to the bottom, gets hotter, comes back up to the top. That's what's happening here. But what that means is that the new material that's made deep down in the center, uh, the core area, can be pulled up to the surface. And now the star is pulsating. And these stars are red giants. So you're talking about a star that's maybe the mass of the sun, but its surface is out by Mars. Now the surface gravity is very low, the star is pulsating. And so those new elements that it's brought up to the surface get pushed out into space. They achieve escape velocity very easily and they just get flung out into space. And so what we get is a periodic, uh, what we call pulsation driven mass loss. So the pulsation of the star pushes material out and as it's pushed out, you get these waves of higher density of stuff. So where it's light, it's high density, where it's dark, it's low density. And so right at the star, you're, um, you're seeing material being pushed out as, it, as the star pulsates outwards, as it comes in, it stops doing that, and then it pulsates outwards again. So we're making carbon deep down inside the star, and we're bringing it to the surface and throwing it out into space. And as we saw in our very first video, most of the carbon that's in your bodies and in the universe comes from these low mass stars that die in ways that are not explosive. And so here we can see, this is the egg nebula, this is a carbon rich uh, nebula. And what you can see here, this is actually shells of material that were once part of the star. There's a star hidden behind this dark bit here. And there are these shells of material that's made of the dust, the, the carbon that is now like soot or ash. It's condensed into dust and it's in shells. And that's the same thing that's as the star throws material out and then it shrinks and throws material out. And so what we can see is evidence for this in the uh, observations that we have of stars that are in the process of dying. So, as I said, for these low mass stars, the ejection is happening over a few million years. It might be a few hundred thousand years or a million years, depending on the mass of the star, but it's not happening in an instant. It's not an explosion. The low mass stars do make most of the carbon. And in fact, they make a lot of heavy elements, but they just don't do it as effectively as some of the high mass stars. However, they do make elements heavier than iron, not just heavier than carbon, but heavier than iron. And we will come back to that in a future video.